Well, good to see you all. Again, a warm welcome to Thousand Hills and also those who are watching through Church Online. And if you're here as a guest, uh, feel welcome here. So good to have you along for the ride. And of course, if you're here as a regular, very welcome as well. So good to, uh, to be here in God's house and be, be learning more about God uh, during this series on uh, origins, which is basically we're digging into the first chapters of the book of Genesis and uh, finding out more about how God created the world. And uh, we'll get to that in just a few moments. My name is Sebastian van Wessem, lead pastor here at Thousand Hills. And uh, it's a great privilege to be leading this amazing group of people that you all get to be a part of. Why don't you just put your hands together for yourself. Yeah. Amazing people. Well, um, today is a special day because there is Connect Group kickoff. Uh, which is going to be amazing. We got about 50 groups, um, not just in Hilversum and Huizen. We got groups all over the place, uh, including groups in Amersfoort and Almere, Lelystad, and um, the Utrecht area, and then um, uh, also in Naarden, uh, Naardenbussum, that area. So all over the place, we got some groups, and we want to encourage you to find a group that suits you. Uh, so go online and check it out, uh, thousandhills.nl slash groups. Um, or uh, just go, go to the Welcome Center at the end of the service and uh, figure out what we have for you. Uh, because I truly believe that life is better lived um, together than it is by yourself. And um, a group is here to support you, to help you grow in your, in your walk with God as well. So make sure you check that out as well. Uh, then uh, Pastor Yoko already mentioned it, that uh, we're launching, we're helping launch a church in uh, the city of Dusseldorf. It's called Kirche für Dusseldorf. And um, looking forward to hear great reports after the day. I think, I believe hundreds of people will have come to that launch service. And uh, not only that, in two weeks' time, there's two more churches launching that we're a part of. One in uh, the city of Dublin. It's called Open Arms uh, Church Dublin. So we, we get to be a part of that. And then there's another church launching in, um, in Breda. We also are a part of that City Life Church Breda. So if you have friends living in those areas, make sure you connect them with those new uh, church plants. And this is all because we're part of a church planting network called ARC, Association of Related Churches. And our biggest passion is to see life-giving churches launched all through the Netherlands and Europe. And you're, you're, through your giving, you get to be a part of this as well. So it's going to be amazing. Um, and I look forward to what God is going to do through that. So how many, how many of you have ever been surprised by how different people can be yet so alike at the same time? How many of you have ever been wondering about the difference between people, right? Yeah, it's, I love an international church like this. Because I, I, last time we did a count, we had about 13 nationalities. But the count, we did it like years, many years ago. So I think we probably upped that from 30 to probably 50 nationalities just here in Ilversum. How cool is that? It's just, you know, all these nationalities, all these cultures represented in one place. Uh, it just shows how, how amazing God is. That he's the God of all those nationalities, all, all those cultures. And I had to think of my own twin boys. I mean, it's funny because uh, when people ask me about my kids and they ask me of what age they are, I say, well, they're almost eight. They're like, huh? Almost eight? So they both are the same age? How did you guys do that? Well, it's twins. Twins. So, yeah, of course, they're, they're, they have the same age. And, you know, oftentimes when, we, when I talk about my kids, uh, people automatically assume that, that they will be very similar because they're twins, right? Well, you got... Um, um, you got fraternal twins and you have identical twins. Our boys are fraternal twins. And, and, and two kids can't be more different than my two boys. Really. Like one has blue eyes, the other one has brown eyes, for instance. One loves Lego, the other one loves reading. Donald Duck, you know. <laughs> and then one loves to spend time by himself and the other one loves to be with other people, especially his brother. You can imagine that they, that's, that they end up in fights because one wants to be left alone and the other one is trying to engage him in playing or fighting or whatever, you know? It happens. And that's just within one family. You can see how different two, two kids are, two twin boys are. And it, there's beauty in how different God has created us all. But we have more in common than you think. Today we're going to look at uh, creation again. And we're going to look at the creation of mankind, of how God created humans. 
And I, you know, last, last week we talked a little bit about evolution theory and how evolution theory doesn't explain how life came into being and how, how the human race um, came into existence. And, and, but today I want to look at the why. Why did God create human beings? Why did God create humans like Adam and Eve and like you and me? And I believe that God has created us for relationship. He created us for, in particular, three important relationships. First and foremost, with God himself. Second of all, with other people. And in particular, one other person that is our spouse. Very important relationship. And last but not least, with creation. We're supposed to have a relationship with creation as well. I'll tell you more about that in just a, just a moment. But would you mind if I just kind of toss things around a little bit and start with the third relationship, then work my, with my way back to the first relationship? Is that okay? Okay, three of you are okay. The rest of you are okay too? Okay, well, we'll just keep moving, okay? So the third relationship that, uh, that I believe is very important and that we can find back in the, in the story in Genesis is the relationship with creation. In verse 26, and you can find it repeated in verse 28 in the first chapter of Genesis, it says this. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign, everybody say reign, reign, over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock and the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. That word reign, just want to zoom into that uh, just for a few moments. We need to be good stewards of creation. We need to be good stewards of this world that God has given to us. And, and a couple of questions we need to ask ourselves and is, you know, do we waste energy? Do we use too much plastic? You know, you, you, you hear stories about the plastic sea, you know, in some parts of the oceans where there's just plastic for miles and miles and miles around. Do we use chemicals that maybe are hurting the environment? And the creation account suggests that the humans, um, before um, the fall, the fall of mankind, before the curse came into being, that, that humans were actually vegetarians. In fact, not just humans were vegetarians, every animal was a vegetarian as well. And maybe there's one good thing that came out of the fall, and that is steaks and ribs, right? Some of you are thinking, I don't want to go back to being a vegetarian here. But maybe, let me just ask this question. Maybe it's good to limit the amount of meat that we eat. If you're a meat lover, which I am, to be honest with you, maybe not, not eat as much as you would normally eat because it does have, leave a big um, imprint on the, on, on, on the world, on creation. You know, it has a big impact on the environment when we eat a lot of meat. There's another thing that we need to understand about our relationship with creation. That's in verse in, found in, verse, in chapter 2, verse 15. The Lord placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. To tend and watch over it. You know, if you look back at what we looked at last time, we, you saw that the Lord, God, created the world in six days. He worked six days, and then he had a day of rest. Mankind was also created to do work. This is important for us to realize. Man was created to do work. This was before the fall. God said, uh, you need to tend and watch over the garden, the garden of Eden. In other words, to be, to be good stewards over everything God has created, that, that's what he calls us to. And we all have a responsibility that we leave this earth in a better way for our children and our grandchildren. That's part of being a good steward. We all have a responsibility there. There's another thing that we can learn from this story, and that is that, that, that work is not a result of the curse. Work is not a result of the fallen earth that we live in. Because sometimes that's how we kind of treat our jobs. It's like it's a necessary evil that you have a job and that you need to work hard. But man was already working before the fall came. This is something that, you know, this is how God programmed it into the world. And, and you know, if you stop seeing your, your job as a result of the curse, as a result of um, the fact that it's a fallen world, you will actually be able to find a certain level of fulfillment in your work. And it's a good thing to find fulfillment in your work. If you hate your job, you know, probably the first thing you should try is change your heart attitude about it. Because if you start seeing it as a positive thing, you, you'll probably be more positive towards your job. 
But if you really hate your job, maybe it's time to look for another job and to basically take the risk that maybe, you know, that, that you need to go on this journey to find another, pl another place that, that is better than what you, what, where you are at the moment. It's important to, to find a certain level of fulfillment in, in our work because it's something that God has created for us. It's, 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 a, it's a great thing that we actually get to work. At the same time, we got to be careful that we don't become workaholics. Now, some of you are probably looking at the person sitting next to you because they're a workaholic or something. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like a workaholic. I like, I like working. I love working. But... It's, imp it's important to note that, that you don't get so caught up with your work that you don't do anything else anymore, that you kind of um, forget about your family, forget about your relationship with God. It's so easy if you like your job that, that, that you actually get sucked up into it. So we got to be careful to not become workaholics. At the same time, we can find a certain level of fulfillment in what we do for a living. And that's a good thing. Let's work to make this world a better place. As we work, as we live our lives as Christians, let's, let's, let's be a good steward of creation, of the world that God has given to us. So we need to be in a, in a relationship with, with creation, with the world, but there's another relationship that, that we need to manage well, and that's the relationship with other people. In particular, our relationship with our spouse. And I love how, how chapter 1 and 2 of Genesis give us two different perspectives on the, cre of, on the creations, creation of mankind. Genesis 1.27 says this, Male and female he created them. And then chapter 2 shows us why he created us the way he did. Genesis 2.18 says this, That the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper who is just right for him. I don't know about you about your husbands if you're a wife. But this, this describes me. It's not good for me to be alone. You know, sometimes it's nice to be alone, but I, you know, I, spend, I actually got married fairly late. Probably, I, I think it was 30 when I got married. And, and, and I, I can tell you this, I, I'm a messy person. You wouldn't say that, because I don't look like I'm a messy person. You know, my hair is all, you know, thank you very much for the compliment. But I, I, I'm not as organized as I should be, probably. And ask my wife or ask our executive pastor. You, they'll tell you. Also, I am, uh, you know, a little, you know, also, you know, I, don't, I didn't eat too healthy when I was by myself. How many of you love French cheese? Okay. <laughs> so a few of you cheese lovers out here. I love French cheese. So I, I studied economics, then I worked a couple of years, then I moved to, to Belgium to study theology. And, and what I did is, you know, because I love French cheese so much, what I did is I, I had French cheese for breakfast, then I had French cheese for lunch, then I had French cheese for dinner. Because I was too lazy to cook, right? It's not good for a man to be alone. So what happened is that, um, that um, I was gaining weight in just one place. It's right here. <laughs> so I gained like five kilos or even more than that. It was pretty, pretty bad. You know, it just shows us that it's not good for a man to be alone. It isn't. <laughs> we need, you know, a wife in our lives to kind of keep us in, in check, at least for some of us, someone like me, at least. So what, God, what did God do? Because he realized that, that Adam needed a helper. He let all the animals parade in front of Adam, and basically to let him make a choice which one was the right helper for him. And so the donkey came by. That's a bad impression. You could probably do way better than I did. But the donkey wasn't smart enough. So then he led a horse parade in front of Adam. And, you know, the legs were good of the horse, and it was definitely a bit smarter. Still, it was a horse. And then the elephant came by, and elephant is very strong, and it's amazing to have an elephant to be a helper, right? Because he can carry basically anything. The problem was that the elephant didn't fit in Adam's house. And then a dog came by. Of course, a dog is kind of kind of cute, but the personal connection with a dog is up to a certain point, right? We all know that. For those of you who are dog lovers, dog lovers, 
So none of those animals was the right helper for Adam. So then God causes Adam to, to fall into a deep sleep and makes, makes Eve from Adam's rib. And Eve became Adam's helper. The woman became Adam's helper. Now you may think that that word helper means that Eve was kind of like inferior to, to Adam. It's, a, it's an interesting thought, and I think within Christianity for, for many ages, uh, we've actually thought that, that, that women were inferior, inferior to, to men, but this is not, not the case. Because when you go back to the word in, in Hebrew, it's the word ezer, which, which means helper, but it means something different than just somebody who's like a servant. Because the same Hebrew word is used in relation to God, uh, because he is a very present help in time of need. So actually, you know, the, the wife that God made for Adam was a helper at the same level or maybe even, even more than that for Adam because, because God is a present help in time, in time of need as well. God is a helper as well. God is an Ezra as well for, for, for mankind uh, just as much as the wife is. Now don't start to idolize your wife, guys. That's also not the right thing to do, but we're created to be in a relationship with our spouse. We're created to be in a relationship with other people. We're created to be in a relationship with God, and, and we need to allow them to become our helper. Not only that, we need to be their helper as well. I believe that life is best lived together. That's why we have a Connect Group kickoff, because we can live life together and we're stronger together. But God created us to be in a special relationship with one particular person. One person from the opposite gender. Genesis 2.24 says this. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. And the two are united into one. They're united into one flesh. And that, that special relationship can be fruitful and can lead to multiplication. And it says in Genesis 1.28, Then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. And we've been pretty good at filling the earth, right? Seven billion people walking around this earth. And that's what Adam and Eve did. They obeyed God's command. And in Genesis 4.1 it says, Now Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. Adam knew his wife. That's an interesting word in the Hebrew. And that word knowing is way more than a head knowledge. It's, it's an intimate, intimate knowing. And this speaks of sexual intimacy. And it's more than just a physical thing. This is so important for us to realize that, that sex goes so much further than, than just the, 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 the act of sexual intercourse. There's actually an emotional dimension to, to sex as well. There's a, there's a spiritual dimension even to sex. That's what you see here in this passage. And we got to realize that sexuality is a gift to enjoy, but, but it's, it's placed in the context of a faithful marriage between one man and one woman with the ultimate goal of fruitfulness and multiplication. That's the context of sexuality. And we got to realize this one thing because sometimes, you know, I actually remember when I lived in Amsterdam Southeast, I was studying economics in those days, and, and my, I, you know, I just came to faith, and I was very excited about being a Christian, and I started to talk to one of my neighbors, uh, a girl um, who had, I think, several boyfriends, and so I talked to her about faith, I talked to her about, you know, how important it is to kind of surrender your life to Jesus, and she said this one thing, that, that she actually thought that sex was a bad thing. I said, no, sex is a good thing. God created it. He actually created it before the fall. He created it before, you know, we messed it up as, as humans. It's a good thing. Sex is a good thing. It's a very good thing if we keep it sacred within the context of a faithful marriage between one man and one woman. So God created us to be in relationship with creation, to be in relationship with other people, in particular our spouse, but he, the most important relationship, and I want to zoom in on that a little bit more today, and that is the relationship with, with God himself. So the relationship with God is so important, so amazing. And I want to give you six characteristics, almost like six take-homes about that relationship. And I want you to take notes of that or take pictures, whatever, you know, when the six points appear on the screen. But let's read Genesis chapter 1, verse, uh, starting at verse 26. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. 
And here you can find the most important relationship that we can have. That is a relationship with God. And I love how this passage that, that God says, let us make humans. Let us. The whole trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit was involved with the creation of human beings. He was, you know, God is one in three persons. And they were all involved when he created us. And not just involved, God was personally involved with when he created Adam and Eve. And that's an important thing. He was, he, God is personally involved with creating mankind. Personally involved. He says, let us make mankind. You know, when God created everything else of the created order, God just spoke a word and it happened. Let there be light, and there was light. When you look at, look at the animal world, let, let, let there be a giraffe. Bang, a giraffe. Look at it, standing right here. Let there be a crocodile. Bang, a crocodile came into being. Let there be a rabbit. Bang, a cute little rabbit came into being. Let there be an eagle, and there's an eagle flying. Bang. Let there be a lizard. Bang, lizard. All these animals. But with humans... God knew he wanted to have a personal relationship with mankind. So at the very outset, he wanted to build that relationship. He, he's, he was personally involved. He's, he like, like he shaped mankind personally. I have to think of the image of the potter, you know, working with the clay and making a beautiful creation. That's, that's the image that God gives of how he created mankind. You're like the clay and God is the potter. He personally fashioned you, made you into the perfect person that, that, that he had in mind. So important. God was personally involved when he created mankind. Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. Like us. God created us in his image to be like him. To be like him. God calls us, God created us to be a, a representation of the Trinity. Because within the Trinity, there's like a perfect harmony going on, a perfect communication, a perfect relationship going on. And he created us to be in a perfect relationship with the triune God. He created us for a perfect relationship. That's so important, you know. We're created in his image. And it doesn't mean that God kind of looks like, like he has two legs and two arms. You know, God is spirit. But our character and, and the way uh, our emotions, our whole being, we're created in his image. We're created to be like him. And he also created humans so, so that he could delegate part of his responsibility to them. Because we saw before that God created us to reign, to reign. Just think of this. The God who created the universe, who is a sovereign ruler over everything that is created... He calls us to reign. We're, we're called to be God's representatives in this world. And to be a good representative, we need to have a good relationship with him because we need to know his heartbeat. Because you only can rep represent someone if you know his heartbeat. If you, if you truly want to represent that person, if you truly want to be a good ambassador of that other person, you need to know what's going on in their heart. You need to know what, what they feel is important and what they feel is less important. We need to know their heartbeat. And, you know, you got to imagine that, that God chose to, to um, use a creation like us who sometimes just ignores God, who has the free will to do whatever we want. He chooses to work through us. And he chooses to delegate part of his responsibility to us to, to make this world a better place. How amazing is that? I mean, God could have created robots God could have used angels. It's way more safe for him to do it that way, but he chose to, to use free moral agents like ourselves to work with us and through us to make this world a better place. He created us to reign. He created us to make this world a better place. And then the text repeats the fact that God created human beings in his image, but there's something more that it adds to it. Verse 27, so God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female he created them. God created humans, male and female. We're different, 
but equal. We're both created in his image. So important. That's point number four. God created male and female different but equal. You know, God didn't make a mistake when he created you, a, when he made you a boy or a girl. He, he created you male or female, and he saw that it was very good. But know that even if you decided to change your gender, because that's a, that's a thing that is happening more and more in our society, that God still loves you. There's nothing that we can do that will, God make us, will make God love us less. But God didn't make a mistake when he created you male or female. And only after both man and woman were created, the work of creation was complete. It says in verse 31, then God looked, looked over all that he had made and he saw that it was very good. When he saw just Adam, it wasn't finished. Creation wasn't finished. I mean, Adam is great, but there needed to be this beautiful lady, Eve, for it to be complete. To say that, yes, it's very good. We got a good couple here that's going to reign over the world. He said it was very good. With the creation of humans, God finished his work. We're the pinnacle of God's creation. We've got to realize that. There's something special about humans. That's why, the, that's why there's so much value in human life. Verse, chapter 2, verse 7, you know, it also underlines this. It says, this, Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man become a, became a living person. All the translations say a living soul. And again, again, you can see how hands-on, or breath-on, if you, if you want to say it that way, God was involved with creating humans. The breath of life, the Hebrew word for that is neshama, neshama, which means soul. If you look at all the animals that were created, none of those animals, God breathed life in them, into them. None of them got a soul as we humans have. Just check the first chapter of Genesis. We, you don't see it happen, you know, that God breathed life into the monkey or whatever. He just breathed life into mankind, into Adam. And that's what sets us apart from the animal world. We're special. God created us in a special way. And that's point number five. We're set apart from the animal world because God breathed our soul into us. Who we are defines who we are. There's one more thing that I want to highlight here. Verse 20, uh, chapter 2, verse 25. Now the man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. They were naked, but felt no shame. It's interesting. Because they were totally comfortable with, with walking around naked. There was, was, was some innocence there, a very special innocence that helped them to have an amazing, amazing relationship with God. There was no shame, there was no guilt in, in the way of their relationship with God at this point. There was no guilt, there was no shame in their relationship to each other. Nothing like that. How cool is that? And, and I, I believe that the point for us today is, is, is the same thing. We can relate to God without shame and guilt. We can go back to the beginning. We can go back to the pre-fall state where there's no, no shame and no guilt in the way in our relationship with God anymore. Just need to go back. And I'll tell you more about that in just a few moments. But why did God create us? I think the answer is, is clear. God created us to have a relationship with us. God didn't want to be alone in that way either. He wanted to have a relationship with people who can choose for themselves whether they want to have a relationship with him. He also created us to be the crown upon his creation. Again, the dogma, and I don't like the word dogma, but I have to use it here. The dogma of the Trinity is so important because it was perfect harmony, perfect communication, perfect relationship within the Trinity. And Jesus speaks about it in John chapter 17, verse 20 and 21. I do not pray for these alone, and these were his disciples, the 12 disciples around him. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, which includes you and me. Because it's like they, 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 they told the story about Jesus to the people living in their day and age, and they passed it on to the next generation, to the next generation, and finally it ends up with us. So he, Jesus prays there 2,000 years alone, not just, uh, ago, not just for the 12, but also for us. That they all may be, one, may be as one as your Father, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us. 
that the world may believe that you sent me. How cool is this? So, so Jesus prays that, that we will be one with God and that we will be one with each other. And the example that he gives is actually how the Trinity, how God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is one. One God, three persons. An amazing closeness there that, that, that God had in mind. And, and, it's, and it's, there's so much unity with among us. That's, how, that's what he's praying for. There's so much unity among us that the world around us will see uh, that there's something different about us. That the world around us will, will notice that we have this special connection with God, that we have this special connection with each other as believers. And this world is longing to see people who intimately know their God. That is what creation is longing for. There are people who will stand up and who have this, this deep sense of knowing God, knowing God intimately. And the people around us will see that there's something different about you and me if, that, if that's the case. In just a few moments, I want to extend God's invitation to you to enter into a relationship with Him through, through a simple prayer. And the beauty is God made us free moral agents. agents. He, he gave us a free choice to respond to that invitation, to respond to that relationship or not. There's no pressure for any of us to respond to that. But, but let me tell you, it is the life that God has in mind for you, the life that he has planned for you, the relationship that he wants to have with you is so amazing that you don't want to miss out on this. It's so beautiful. And it's available for every single person in this room. It's available for every person who's maybe still far away from God at this moment in their life. And only because of Jesus can we go back to that perfect harmony, to the perfect relationship with God that you can see in the life of Adam and Eve before the fall. And that is the very reason why Jesus came to this world, why he bled and died on that cross and rose again on the third day so that we could have life, life abundant, life eternal, but also have that perfect relationship, that harmonious relationship that he had in mind from the beginning. You got to think of that. God was so personally involved when he created you. And there's nothing more than he wants than for you to go back to that perfect relationship that, that was there before, before humankind fell. And it cost God the best thing that he had, his one and only son. Jesus prayed that they all may be one, as one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us. Now, what would it look like if all of us had a relationship with God just like that? If all of us could experience a closeness, a relationship that is that vibrant, no more shame and guilt in the way of us and God. No more shame and guilt in our relationship towards other people because of the mistakes that we made, the sins that we've committed. We're just free to experience his love and grace and mercy for us. I don't know about you, but there have been many times in my life where I wandered away from that relationship, where I kind of drifted off. Maybe because they're, you know, of sinful habits or, or, or things that kind of creep into your heart. Or maybe I've been too busy at times in my life. And when you get too busy, Jesus no longer is your prime focus. And I'm, I'm here to tell you that this is something that we all struggle with as humans. I'm a pastor, but don't think that I'm, I'm less human than you are. I've, I've, I struggle with the same tendencies as every person in this room. We all have the tendency to walk away. We all have the tendency to do our own thing. We all have the tendency to no longer put God num at number one in our lives. We all have the tendency to wander away. And every time it happens in my life, there's like a cloud, a cloud of shame and guilt that would come on me. And because of that cloud of shame and guilt, I, it feels like you can't approach God anymore. But every time I remember that God is beckoning me to return to Him, to, to return to His love, to return to a perfect relationship with Him. God did everything in His power to, to restore that relationship. That cloud of, of shame and guilt doesn't have to be on us anymore. 
because there's free access to God the Father through what Jesus has done for us. The Apostle Paul says this, the grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. I love that. The grace of our Lord Jesus was poured out. It's like, it speaks of abundance. Imagine that, that, that you have access to, the, access to the abundance of heaven. The best things that heaven has to offer to us. It's, it's like it's, it's at our disposal. It's just one step away, one, one simple prayer away that we have access to everything that God has for our lives. The grace of our Lord, along with the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus, the faith and the love that he has for us, he wants to birth that in our heart. He wants to give that to us personally. And my challenge to you this morning is to open yourself up to that grace, to that love, to that faith that God wants to birth in your life, that God wants to pour out abundantly in your life. In Romans 5, 5, Paul says this, and this hope will not lead to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us, he has poured out the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. His his Holy Spirit is available for every person who surrendered their life to Jesus. And, 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 And all that, all that love can be poured out in our heart today. It's like liquid love that's available to you and me right now. We need to open our hearts to it. It's the only thing we have to do. We don't have to do anything. but Just say, come Lord. I receive this for my life. I receive it right now. Because he's here in our midst. And he wants to touch you, all of us here in this place. So no matter where you're going through, no matter the shame and the guilt that it may be beyond your life today, I believe that can be washed away can be taken away because God has already paid the price for you. Jesus already paid the full price for you on the cross. Let's close our eyes and bow our heads. Father, we come to you at this moment. God, your word says that that we can return to you with all our hearts, with all our heart. God, so often we let Shame and guilt cloud that relationship with you, Lord. But God, you want to take us back to how it was. Back in the day when Adam and Eve walked without shame and guilt in that garden before sin entered into the world. That's, that's where, you, where you want to take us back to, God. And I thank you, Lord, that you want to shower your, your love and your grace and your mercy and all the good things from heaven over our lives today. God, you've called us to a life of abundance, of experiencing so much more than we experience at this moment, Lord. And God, we open our hearts to you at this moment to experience your love like like never before. Pour out your love in our lives. Pour out your love in our lives. We need you, God. Call us back to the perfect relationship perfect friendship with you, oh God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.